doubt that people are searching. They're, they're searching for truth, they're searching for something that's real. Um, they're looking, whether they know it or not, they're looking for God. And I have to trust that. You know, we have our part to play within that. And I'm excited about that, that we have the opportunity to do so, to affect into the lives of people, not just within these four walls, but our neighbors, friends, people who you know, might check in online. Uh, we have so much opportunity to you know, do work for the kingdom and to do the things that Christ commanded us to do. And so we do that here on Sunday mornings, and we do that the rest of the week, I trust, because that's who we're called to be as Christians who follow Christ all the time. Amen? Would you stand with me this morning? And let's just start our service together um, with a word of prayer. And uh, again, I have some scriptures and songs for us to celebrate Christ with as uh, we continue to be thankful people. It was Thanksgiving Sunday last week, but are we still thankful? Did we have a thankful week? Did we find we were more thankful? Sometimes just for the little things? And uh, be thankful in everything, right? That was the, one of our verses last week. But let's... Let's dedicate this week, this time, and ourselves to God today. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you that you are with us, that you are the God who is near, and you've never left or forsaken us, and you never will. You are here with us in this place. You promise that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. So, Father, we are in your presence, the presence of the creator of the universe, the king of the universe. And so we honor you, bless you, and thank you that we can come into your presence and bless your name, lift up your name, sing your praises, read and learn from your word, and have this wonderful thing we call fellowship together as we disciple one another as followers of Christ. We pray your blessing on this time, on your word, and that we would really hear from you today, all for your glory. For your kingdom, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Our first psalm is from Psalm 96. Let's read this together as uh, we prepare our hearts for worship today. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Amen.
psalm, we, we, the first words were, sing a new song to the Lord. This next one may be a new song, although it's actually a very old song. We're jumping back into, I think, the late 70s, early 80s with this one. So uh, maybe just before Raphael was born or Stephanie and I were infants. No, it's not that old. But it's, it's an older song. Maybe you know it. Maybe this may be new to you. But it's from Psalm 5. And so I thought, well, let's read the song first. And then realize that you know most of the psalms were songs to be sung. And so that's what we're going to do with this one this morning. Let's read it together first. And we're going to sing it together. Anyone know Psalm 5 as a song? I think so. Oh, yeah. Two, maybe three? No, oh, we'll see how we do. Let's read it together. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. That's the ESV translation. The song is taken from the King James Version. So let's get our these and thous and shouts all ready. And we're going to jump into a song that uh, takes those words and makes them a song to the Lord. the opportunities you will put before us in order to be your representatives here in this world, in our community, in this city where we live. God, I pray that we are always attentive to your voice, to your word, to your calling on our lives, to be good, faithful disciples of Jesus, your son. May we model our lives after his life, and in so doing, God, may others see Jesus living in us and be drawn to him as Lord and King and Savior. Thank you, God. We bless your name. One more scripture here this morning. Or did I put a scripture before this one? Maybe I did. I did. Psalm 34. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted 
and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Isn't that awesome? Anyone have a struggling time this week? Or last week? Or somewhere in life? It's good to know that God is with us through all our afflictions and our troubles. Amen? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear.
let us go out of your hand. No one can snatch you away, snatch us away from you. God, you are so good. You are almighty. You're all knowing. You know, every heart, every need here this morning. God, we just want to spend some time in prayer. And so we thank you that we can do so because of Christ. The opening and the tearing of the veil that separated us from you. Now we are in your presence and can be here, anywhere, anytime because of Christ. It's in his mighty name we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Last week, we looked into the beginning portions of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Um, We saw him riding on a donkey's colt, heading down from the Mount of Olives and and heading through the the Kidron Valley and starting to approach the, the eastern gate of Jerusalem. There's a parade of his disciples waving palm branches, singing and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you'd think that this would be the absolute world-changing moment, at least they did, when here's the King of Kings, Messiah is coming, he's going to rule on David's throne, and everything will be wonderful and perfect. And so they're shouting and and just, you know, absolutely enthralled with what's about to happen. It's so exciting. The greatest gift ever given is about to be, you know, put on the throne. They must have been so excited. We have an opportunity in the next few weeks to to give gifts as we approach Christmas, which I read somewhere online. Someone said, you realize there's only like 10 Fridays left till Christmas? And like, wow. Perspective. But before that time, before the middle of November, we have an opportunity to bring gifts and put together gifts for people in many parts of the world. I'm not sure where... Operation Christmas Child will be sending our gift boxes this year, but Marlene has brought a few today and some information is up on the the boards there in the foyer and you can look to see uh, about how to prepare a gift to send to someone, a child, so that they can not just have a gift, but they can receive the gift of the gospel. And we hear the stories of the tens of thousands of children, families who come to know Christ through this ministry. And so pray for those things. And if if you have questions, you can ask Marlene and she'll gladly help you out with that. There are a few shoe boxes here today that you can bring home and and send off to different parts of the world. A gift being sent. That was Christ. The gift that was sent. And he's coming in this scene down to Jerusalem. And it's, it's just an awesome scene. The Pharisees get all upset and they say, Teacher, tell your disciples to be quiet. He says, oh, if these would be silent, even the rocks would cry out. It's a pretty cool little moment. But the celebration changes as we look into more of Luke today. You ever been at a celebration of some kind? Birthday party, uh, maybe a big, uh, I don't know, a, a festival or a parade, something that's, that's really, really you know, exciting and festive and there's a, a feeling of joy and happiness And suddenly something awkward happens that brings everything to a standstill. Among the gaiety of laughter and joy, there's a a different sound, that of someone crying. And not just crying, sobbing. Not in pain, but in deep heartfelt anguish hurt feelings, extreme disappointment. Something's wrong, and you can sense that. What does that do to that environment of a party? Kind of brings it down, doesn't it? Gets us down to, well, what's going on? And that's where we find ourselves in today's portion of the Gospel of Luke. In the midst of this great celebration coming down the Mount of Olives, There's also great sorrow felt by the one that everyone is celebrating. It's like going to someone's birthday party and the person that you're celebrating breaks into tears. I had this song going around in my head, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. But I don't think that's what Jesus was singing in his heart as we look into Luke 19, 41 to 44 today. 
And uh, we look at Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. So if you've got your Bible, turn there. It'll also be on the screen for you here. And uh, we'll take a look through this. And that, is, that was one of our first glimpses of Jerusalem when we came into the city, looking down from the Mount of Olives and looking down across to the city of Jerusalem. Now, of course, right now it's massive. It's much bigger. But you can see a little bit of the ancient wall, which is about a square mile of the ancient city of Jerusalem. And that wall still stands today. And that's, that's what Jesus saw. There wasn't a mosque there. There was the temple. And there was Herod's court. And then, of course, the city where people lived. And that was his view as we read verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground. You and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. As the cheering gets closer and closer to the city, probably within earshot of those walls, Jesus looks toward the place where so much has happened in the past. This is Jerusalem. It's said that at the very heart of the temple where now that mosque stands is a rock, and they believe that is the rock where Abraham was ready to sacrifice his son Isaac. It's believed to be like the, the absolute cornerstone of the earth. This is where things happen. This is where where Adam and Eve, this is near Eden, this is the center of life beginning here in this world that God made. And so much is yet to happen there in the future. We know Jerusalem is going to be the central place when Christ returns. This is where He's first going to come and set His foot upon these hills and take control of this world and say, I'm here and now I'm king from being the humble king that's going down on a donkey's colt. He's going to descend from heaven in the same way his disciples saw him ascend to heaven. And he's going to reign in this world for a thousand years and then set up his eternal kingdom for us in this universe. Excited? But in this moment, as the king of kings approaches, here he takes a look at the city and he begins to weep. Jesus, crying. Do we picture that? Do we ever think of Jesus in the flesh? Here He is coming to, to do what He was sent to do, but He's crying. And not just a, a single little tear running down His cheek. No, the word used to describe His crying here is sobbing, tears, weeping, wailing. You ever cried like that? Where your body is just heaving in tears? We see this word used many times throughout Scripture. It's the same one used as when Herod's soldiers came through the town of Bethlehem and slaughtered the children under two years old. And there was wailing in Bethlehem because her children are no more. Same word. Can you imagine seeing your child slaughtered in front of you? You'd wail. It's the same word as the widow who lost her son in death as we read in Luke 7. Wailing at the, at the funeral parade as they head off ready to, to bury her son. And she's wailing and crying. Why did this have to happen? Jesus comes and said, hang on. I've got a gift for you. 
and he raises her son to life and returns him to her as a gift. Wow. Different kind of wailing. Celebration. It's the same word that's used when Peter was in the garden peering into the courtyard where they were trying Jesus. And three times he says, I don't know him. No, I tell you, I don't know him. I don't even know the man. And Jesus' eyes meet Peter's. And in that moment he realizes that Jesus had said, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Oh, no, Lord, I would never deny you. Yeah, he did. And when that reached his heart, when he realized that he was able to deny Christ right there, it brought him to wailing, weeping tears. He wept bitterly is the way we read that. This is how Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. Just looking at that city, knowing all of its history, its present, and its near and far future, He weeps. Do we relate to that? Do we relate to that in the way we maybe have suffered loss, pain, anguish in our own lives? I'm sure we have. When we got the news that our son had cancer and it was a very aggressive type that had a 70% mortality rate, I cried. I still remember sitting in that room Beside him, he was in one portion. I was in a separated room from him to make sure he would not catch anything I might have. And separated by this glass, wailing and crying through the night, praying for my son. I remember that, that struggle. God, why? Why him? Why not me? Take me, don't take him. And those were hard tears for my son. He's one life. Jesus looked at this city and he saw the thousands who lived there. And he knew what was going to soon happen in that city and it brought him to cry, to weep, and to wail. Does it affect us when we see others crying? I, I'm a pretty easy leaker. And when others are crying, it'll move me to tears. If you have that, that's called empathy. A caring for someone else because they're struggling through something. You see them hurting, and so it hurts you. Scripture tells us that when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. So when we see someone amongst the people we know, whether they're part of our direct church family or part of the greater kingdom, and we see them suffering, it should hurt us. I read a news story this morning that there are 17 missionaries in Haiti who were kidnapped yesterday and are being held at threat of their life for ransom. And they're not the only ones. This has been happening quite a lot as a nation has fallen apart politically and physically through the earthquakes and the terrible things that have happened in that nation. And now here's 17 missionaries who just finished building an orphanage for those who need a place to stay to be safe, and now they've been taken, and now we fear for their lives. We should pray for them, that God would protect them, release them, and bring their captors to repentance. Back to our, our scene here in, in Jerusalem. Picture Jesus weeping. He's riding on this donkey's colt and he's sobbing. I wonder what that did to the celebration. I wonder who caught it first that Jesus was crying. Who noticed amongst the throng of people shouting, Hosanna! Hang on. Why? Why is he weeping? And what is he weeping over? Has someone died? We've seen Jesus weep before when Lazarus, his friend, died. The shortest verse in all of the Bible was written to let us know the importance of it. When Lazarus died, 
What's the verse? Jesus wept. Exactly. Again, that same word. He weeped. He wailed. He cried intense, heavy, bitter tears. A lost soul? Someone has wandered away from the faith? Someone has has done something heinous? No, he's crying over the city. And it's the same city where he knew in just the next few days he himself would be put to death. That's the place. He's looking at that city and that's where he is going to suffer and die. And rather than turn away in fear or, or, or come down on him upon it, he cries over that city. Why cry over those who would soon torment him? He's God after all, right? This is Jesus. This is God in the flesh. Why not react in anger and say, why would you be so stupid and do something so ridiculous? You fools. I'm going to rain down fire and brimstone upon you instead. You're not going to take me. I'm going to take you. Because that's not the God we have. We don't have a vengeful, angry God. That's not his character. He's, he wasn't there to judge them. Was he being weak? Is Jesus' humanity getting to him? He's, he's weeping and wailing. He's crying. I can maybe picture in my mind Peter, who always overreacts, looking at Jesus crying and Maybe he gets a tear. Jesus, no, don't let them see you do that. Wait, wipe those tears off your face. Stop that. You know, you're, this is a party here. Come on, let's, let's go. What are you crying for? Come on, Jesus, pick yourself up. Peter would do something like that. But we don't know what happened. Was Jesus overwhelmed? We've got to realize he was a very emotional man here on earth. He didn't hide his feelings. We don't see very often in Scripture where Jesus laughed. We don't see often Jesus dancing. We're given imagery of it because he went and attended weddings. And at weddings, if you've ever seen a Jewish wedding, they are a great celebration that goes on not just for a couple hours, but for several days. So I picture Jesus celebrating and dancing and singing along with the people that were there. But we don't read much of that in Scripture. But we do read on several occasions about Jesus weeping, crying. Isaiah tells us that he was a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. He was showing his heart for what he knew was was about to happen in the coming days and years. The destruction of that city at the hand of its oppressors. See, Rome was ruling over Jerusalem. They had their hand in control. And it broke Jesus' heart, God's heart, to know that his people were about to suffer. So it, it hurt him to knowing that they were going to suffer in the future, and it breaks his heart when we suffer now. Death moved Jesus deeply in his spirit, as we talked about with Lazarus. You can read that in John 11, where Jesus wept over the loss of a friend. He lamented over the loss of life, even as we do. Death was never in God's original plan for us. You realize that? When God created him, Adam and Eve, he never said, you're going to die. He created them to have an everlasting, eternal relationship with Him where we could walk with Him in the garden in the cool of the day, every day, forever. That's, that's heaven. That's, that's the way God made it to be. That's perfection. That's what He called good. Hanging out with His creation. Spending time with us. Imagine being able to literally walk and talk with God. You know, walk side by side and chat about things of the universe, things of life. It's going to be amazing. I don't know how long Adam and Eve got to enjoy that time before sin entered their hearts at the temptation of the devil, but that's what happened. They broke God's rule, and he only really had one for them. 
and his design to love him first, and pride got in the way. We break that original design when we sin. And we need to remember that we all have. And maybe we still do. Sin breaks God's heart. And maybe he still weeps over those who walk away from him when we rebel, when we don't heed the call of God on our lives. Maybe God still weeps. The city of Jerusalem, the very center of worship for the Jewish people then and now, the location of the temple, the foundation of the world, they rejected all the messages and the messengers that God sent. All those prophets from days of old that went there and proclaimed that God needs to be God and they need to turn back to him or one day face judgment. And it's that continuing prophecy that brings Jesus to tears in this scene. Weeping, wailing, sobbing, tears. That knowledge that these people who rejected him and continue to reject the the word of the prophets Read it again. The days will come upon you. Your enemies will set up a barricade around you, surround you, hem you in, and tear you down to the ground, you and your children. God and Jesus are pained at the city's lack of acceptance of Him. Despite all the time And all the times in the past he'd reached out to them, conveyed his love for them, and sent the prophets to tell of his plan for salvation, but they wouldn't hear it. Over and over they rejected and even killed the prophets who brought that good news to them. Hey, I'm God, I'm here, I love you, you need to turn to me and have everlasting life. No, we want to do our thing. And they'd string up prophets, they'd burn prophets, they'd do horrendous and heinous things to them that were that don't need to be described here. But hey, you want to read about it? Just read your read your Old Testament. You can see what happened to the prophets. So, what is Jesus' response in his tears and in his anguish over them? He prophesies. Right here and there, at the foot of the walls of the city, he tells them that they are one day going to be put under siege. Overrun, surrounded, and torn down with what not one stone left upon another. The city and its inhabitants would be destroyed. Harsh prophecy. But the truth. God doesn't make it soft and comfortable. He tells the truth, even if it hurts. Why? So the people will listen and wake up and realize he is God and he can and eventually will judge that city, those people, and every individual within it and their decision on what they do with his plan of salvation. And he will do the same for us and for everyone because he is God. And so this prophecy that Jesus talks about happens. It's not a a way off in the thousands of years ahead kind of prophecy. No, it happened some 40 years later in 70 AD. That city was razed to the ground. The Romans came in, surrounded the city, trapped everyone inside, cut off their food and their water and their way of escape until the people were starving and hungry. And then they went in and destroyed it and all of its inhabitants. The walls of the compound that surrounded the temple, they hauled them all down. Every single one of them. They pushed them out and pushed them out until they couldn't push them out anymore. It filled the valley around 
the city. If you look at the, the city of Jerusalem now, you can see the walls and the steps. And we were blessed to, to walk and even sit upon those very steps that existed when Jesus rode into that city. We were there and we can see them, but they weren't like that only about 70, 80 years ago. The stones were still there. They were piled up ground high until Israel became a nation and they came in there with bulldozers and cranes. They lifted away all those stones so you can now see the wall as it stood at its lower foundation. In 70 AD, they shoved all those stones down, these giant boulders the size of the pew you're sitting in, as deep and as wide and as high, and they shoved them all down and pulled them down. There were people hiding in the catacombs underneath the temple. And those rocks kept falling and falling and falling and crushed every single one of them and buried them there. And their bones remained for thousands of years. Jesus' prophecy came absolutely true. Judgment came upon those who refused God's message of salvation. Oh, that you would know the days of peace. Oh, that you'd come to your senses and realize there's a way. I love you and I want you to be with me. But you refuse. And so judgment's going to come. We don't know the condition of every soul within that city. Only God knows the heart of a person. But we see his judgment upon a city. And it remained torn down and it is still not complete some 2,000 years later. Harsh? Yeah. But we've got to remember, holy, righteous, and just God. That's who we serve. That's, that's who we gather and worship here today. That's who we serve every day of our lives. Righteous, holy, and just God. Not some picture on a wall, not some graven image, not some idol. God Almighty, the Creator of the universe, its King and Lord, who loves us. And not just us because we're here. That's the last reason He loves us, because we came to church today. He loves us because we love Him. He loves us because we serve Him. He loves us because we have given our life to Him because He gave His life for us. He loves us because He wants us. He loves us because He created us. He loves us because He's given us purpose to go out and live and serve in this world and serve this city so that they too have a chance to know him or face judgment. I believe the same prophecy is true today. God made a way to be reconciled, to avoid his wrath and his anger and coming judgment through Jesus' own death, the fact that he was willing to go across that valley and go through with God's amazing, indescribable plan of salvation for the sake of you and I and anyone who would believe. Anyone who believes in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone. Including people who might be rejecting Him and laughing at Him and turning away from Him today. People you and I know. That's the same plan. But for those who would refuse the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who would ignore the signs and the wonders that He's provided. We sang that this morning, God of wonders. Just driving to church this morning and seeing all the colors around us, it was just reminding me again of God's amazing creativity and the, the vibrancy of life in creation that demonstrates who He is. People who would ignore the Word itself, the Holy Scriptures that we, we can read and access almost anywhere, anytime who despise it and hate those who profess it as the truth. We are the prophets of today who proclaim the word and the truth of God to those who would hear it, to anyone who would listen. And then they've got the choice as to how to respond. We are today's prophetic voice. What does the world do to the prophets today? Anyone been rejected? Laughed at? Despised? It happens, doesn't it? And yet, we do this. Think about this for a moment. If death and rejection of God brought Jesus to weep, what must the Father have felt 
as he watched Jesus, his son, the second member of the Trinity, the one who has, he's been in eternal perfect relationship with, bore my sin, yours, every sin, and took the weight of that upon himself upon the cross. God had to turn his face away and could not look upon his son because God cannot look upon sin. It cannot be in his presence. Imagine that feeling of separation and imagine for a moment, if you can, the father weeping, having his heart broken because of our sin laid upon his son. God weeps over the lost, whether that's a family, a nation, or a city, such as Jerusalem. It breaks his heart when any one person rebels against him and he knows that he must eventually bring judgment upon that soul. But also, God rejoices and there is celebration in heaven. It goes from the the somber, sad, terrible situation of judgment to rejoicing and celebration over one sinner who repents. One of my favorite verses of Scripture is that there's rejoicing in heaven. The angels in heaven have a parte when one person says, you know what? I'm done with living for myself. I want to live for God. I want him to come and forgive me and I will live for him and live with him forever. Ah, yes! Talk about a celebration time. Does this reflect on us? Is that our attitude? Do we weep over those who are lost? And do we rejoice over those who've come to faith? Do we have the same kind of empathy that Christ had for that city? Do we have that for ours? Are we moved at all? Do we we show emotion when it comes to spiritual things or do we just celebrate, hey, the Canucks won last night and they didn't, by the way. Or do we get all depressed and blah, blah. You know, we show more emotion at a sporting event than we do over Christ the King, our Redeemer. Society's become one that celebrates someone singing on a stage a song that means nothing compared to eternity and aren't moved to tears over amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. People will celebrate and and go crazy when their political party wins, but they don't shed a tear over the thousands of people who are losing their lives to opioid overdose every year in this province, in this nation. People who are left to live destitute under a bridge or in a box who have nothing, and so we do nothing. Are we moved at all for those who are suffering and dying without Christ? Or are we content to say, well, at least I'm saved? God is asking us, do we weep over our city? Tears of sadness over those who are lost so that we will be moved to do what needs to be done. And do we cry tears of joy when one sinner repents? Because one sinner's worth it. Perhaps it was for our understanding, our ability to realize Jesus' familiarity with our human condition, that Jesus wept. And he wept and he felt and he was moved so much so that he was willing to go through with the plan of salvation. He didn't turn around and go back up the Mount of Olives. No, he continued on and into the gates of the city to complete the plan of salvation even though he knew it would cost him everything in this world, his very life. He faced the days of head, the days ahead in the very city that, that he wept over. Oh, that you, you know, I know things are going to be terrible, but I'm still going to do it. I'm still going to do it. It's going to hurt, but I'm going to do it. I hurt, and I'm going to do it. Is that the same truth in us? Do we hurt enough to go do it? Do we feel enough to obey? Jesus prayed in the garden, and we're going to look at that in just a few weeks, where he said, God, you know, if there's any other way that this cup could be taken from me, please, but not my will, yours be done. And over these next few weeks, as we head towards this part of Jesus' ministry, I want us to really consider what 
has moved us to move, to actually do something, to maybe suffer a little, to maybe take a little pain, to realize that there are people suffering an eternity without God in the hell he's prepared for the devil and his angels if we don't do something, if we don't get the word to them and give them the opportunity to know who Jesus is. Because so many don't. Yet, here we are. We're the church. We have the word. We have the answer that every one of those who are lost needs. And we get the opportunity to now go out there and take it to them. That should make us excited. That should get us pumped up and say, you know what? For all those who are suffering out there, we have an answer. We have the answer. Let's go take it to them. Talk about taking it to the streets. Let's go and share with people about Jesus. Let's have conversations that matter. Let's do things that make a difference for eternity. Let's shed tears when we pray. When we realize that there are those who need Christ. Do we pray for our city? For Langford, for Colwood, for Victoria, for, for Vancouver, Toronto, Ottawa, and all of Canada. Are we moved emotionally? Maybe even enough to do something. I hope so. I hope we're excited about what lies ahead yet for West Shore Community Church, for the BC Baptist Conference, for BGC Canada, for all of Christendom, for the fact that we have today and we might get tomorrow to go and share the gospel with someone so that a, one person might turn to Christ and say yes. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? What part are we going to play in that? What is your role within that? What has God gifted you with? What opportunities and relationships and connections do you have that God has put in your lap to say, here's something that I've given you, now go do something with it. Those were the, the ten minas we talked about just a couple of weeks ago. Here's something to work with. Go do something with it. Go cry over that city. Cry, get on your knees in prayer and cry for those lost souls that we all know within our families and our communities around us and say, God, get, show me, give me a way, a, a something to, to connect with them so that they can know you. Help me to bring them the truth and help that truth to set them free. We can't get into a, re a repetitious habit of just praying recited prayers that have no heart, no feeling, no emotion, no empathy. We need to regain a heart for the lost. That's what Christ had. That's why he cried, because there were people lost in that city who were facing judgment without him, who ignored his wondrous works, who've gone their own way. That's Isaiah 53, 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. We've all walked away from God at some point and there's many, many who have. The harvest is plentiful. There are lots of people looking for truth. We just talked about that recently where you know, people are looking during some of the high seasons of, of this world, whether it's Easter, Christmas, Thanksgiving. You know, if 150 some people are willing to look at a, a YouTube video about Thanksgiving and maybe get a glimpse of some truth, that means they're looking for something. So the harvest is plentiful. Problem is, the workers are few. But at least there's a few of them. There's hope in that verse. So we might just be a few here, but guess what? God can do a lot with a few. Look what he did with 12 guys that ended up being 11 guys because one of them even turned on him. And he turned the world upside down. What can God do through us? Lots. What can he do through you? Much. There's hope. There's reason to, to keep going, to keep doing the work that he's called us to do. To say, yes, God, we're going to be faithful in following you. We're going to pray. We're going to trust. We're going to move. And maybe we need to weep and wail to get there. Bring the good news of salvation to the city that he's put you in. Whether that city is Greater Victoria or the city of your household or your workplace or your school. Jesus weeps over the city 
But remember, those angels rejoice over repentance and we can weep too. But we long to rejoice. But that takes a little work, doesn't it? Got to do something. So let's bring that message. Pray for times of rejoicing over, over every person who comes to faith. Great things have happened in and through the work of this church. Over 14 years. As we've been going at this for 14 years. And God's done amazing things, whether it's within these walls or within the community around us. Awesome things. I love testifying and sharing and remembering them. Going through old pictures and looking at old things that, that have happened. Baptisms, coming to faith, outreach. All sorts of great things have been done. Great things have been done. And I believe great things are yet to be done. God's not done, is He? He's not gone. He's got things to do. And guess who He's chosen to do it through? It's us. That's pretty cool. That's a blessing. That fires me up a little bit. I hope that encourages you a bit. That God isn't finished. He's not done. He hasn't returned yet. He says, occupy, keep busy until I come. Well, that isn't, that isn't yet, so there's still things to do. So what are we going to do? I'd like to ask you to do something. Over the next few weeks, as we head towards the Christmas season, some 10, 11 weeks from now, another time when many people will be searching and looking for some truth and some hope in this life, I'd like you to pray. Really pray and seek God out and say, God, what role can we play? What things can I do to further your kingdom in this city? Right where I live. God, give us vision. Give us, give us a, a glimpse as to what it is you want to do and how we can do that. Just something. God, give us, give us a little something. We know there's a great, big, giant plan. But what's my role in that? See, we're all part of this great thing we call the kingdom of God. Us amongst millions in this world. And we all have a role to play. Every single one of us. I'd like you to seek God and say, God, what is my role and how can I fulfill that? And we're going to talk about that. We're going to see that worked out over the, these next few weeks as we head towards Christmas and say, okay, God, let's do this. Let's keep doing this. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you and your kingdom. I'm looking forward to that. Are you? It's exciting. So pray. And if it brings you to tears in empathy and care for those around us who don't yet know him, good. Tears are good. If Jesus wept, maybe we need to do some too. Not forcefully, but out of a heart that cares for the lost in this world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. I pray that you would just sink it deep into our hearts to understand your heart for this city. For whatever city we may find ourselves in. I ask, God, that you would move us to move. To humbly come to you and seek you out and seek your will for us as your church, as your children. To boldly go into our communities, our city, and use whatever gifts, talents, time that you've blessed us with to further your kingdom's work wherever we are. Not for our glory, not for some kind of crown or something acknowledging how wonderful we might be, but to tell over and over again how awesome, mighty, holy, righteous, and deserving of all praise you are. And so God, we look forward with great anticipation for what you are going to do in this city. There are so many who need you, who need to know you, who need to know what it means to follow Christ. And you have commissioned us to go and do that work. Thank you for the opportunity we have before us 
to be the church that you called us to be. And so God, we trust you. We completely trust you. We place our faith, our hope, our very lives in your hands. And whatever the cost, whatever the the burden that gets placed on us, God, we will bear it. We will bear our cross as Christ bore his. He told us himself that we need to daily take up our cross and follow him. So help us to do that with joy. It's Christ who, for the joy set before him, bore the cross. Not because the cross was going to be wonderful. No, it was horrible. But the result of having sin paid for and forgiven through faith in him alone, that's the treasure. And so, God, we look forward to celebrating lives turned over to you, repentance in this city, revival in this city. God, bring it. And may it begin with each of us as we wholeheartedly serve you, love you, and honor you with the life and the gifts you have given us. Thank you, God. It's an honor, a privilege, a blessing to be your church. And we look forward to what you're going to do in and through it, all for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thoughts? Questions? We're going to talk about it on Tuesday. Zoom Bible study, 7 o'clock. Hope you can all plug in. And uh, if you have friends that would like to be part of that, send them the link. And uh, let's all just enjoy fellowship together um, on Tuesdays and every day as we get an opportunity to bless the Lord together. Amen? We'll close with a song. You're the God of this city, you're the king of these people, you're the God of this nation, you are. You're the light in this darkness, you're the hope of the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are. Still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done here. stand and proclaim that as our closing prayer today. You're the God of this city. You're the God of these people. You're the God of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope of the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are.
still to be done in this city. God go with us today. May your presence surround us in this Lord's day. But may we know that you also go with us into tomorrow, and the days ahead, and all the days that we have here in this life. May we serve you in love and amazing faith in what you can accomplish in and through us. May we be anxious over nothing. May we never fear. May we know that you're with us to the very end of the age, knowing that every day for us in this life was written before one of them came to be. You know everything. And we can trust you with everything. And so we do that for your glory, for your kingdom, and yes, God, for this city. We pray over this city. And we will do so. We will honor you and serve you until you come or until we see you face to face. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Um, questions, thoughts, please, we can stick around. There's no need to run, or we'll see you Tuesday or somewhere in between. And uh, God bless you. Go take on this city in whatever way God has, uh, has blessed you to do so. Amen and amen.